Hello, I'm Bowen Feng, the Community Developer at Systems Innovation. And this was a, a live discussion on the topic of complexity and Eastern philosophy for changing times. This is a fantastic discussion with three brilliant panelists. Um, but as you might be able to tell, I'm speaking the past tense um, because actually we had a slight technical error at the start, which means um, the recording cut off the first five minutes or so, which is when I introduced the speakers. So I'm just adding this recording at the start now after the fact, um, before we go into the actual live discussion. And um, partly why I felt uh, it's, it's such an interesting topic to discuss is because as a community of people like ourselves at Systems Innovation who are very interested in the ideas behind systems thinking and complexity, a lot of the things that were developed in these scientific theories which seem very profound and in many cases seem very new, in many cases were actually developed uh, or, or discovered, let's say, millennia ago in certain Eastern traditions and, and spiritual traditions. So I think this is a great opportunity with, with three um, panelists who really kind of bridge this gap to kind of flesh out what are some of the overlaps, what are some of the differences uh, and things that we can really learn from both fields. Um, and so now I'd love to move on to introducing the speakers. And so firstly, we have Orit Gao, who is a senior lecturer for strategy and complexity at Regents University London. Orit is the inventor of social acupuncture, an approach to systems change inspired by Eastern strategy and medicine, and seeks to subvert, disrupt, and transform complex patterns through approaches analogous to that of acupuncture. And next we have Tanuja Prasad, who is founder at Apply Complexity. Tanuja's work deals with the application of complexity science to the impact business sector. She combines research in Eastern medicine systems, both Chinese and her native Indian, with research in complexity science to develop qualitative and quantitative frameworks for business. And finally, we have Spring Cheng, who is the director at Residence Path Institute. Spring integrates Western human development theory and practice with Eastern ancient wisdom traditions, Taoism and Chinese medicine, and her work combines scientific rigor with holistic, intuitive seeing and sensing. And so on that note, without further ado, let's go into live discussion. Mathematics or physics, I went on to study electrical engineering. And if there is a field that takes us down the path of reductionism in a very strong and one might say pure way, it's engineering. I was taught to take things apart. And once again, this did not in any way gel with my own life, with the way I saw things happening in my life. Oh, and there's an interesting um, quandary, I would say, with engineering, especially, yeah. We are supposed to, the, the, the field of engineering is supposed to go out in the world and create things, whether it's machines or computers, et cetera. But our entire education is based on analysis. We're not taught anything about synthesis. It's very, it's very interesting uh, idea. So when I came across complexity science, it was as though the world suddenly had color in it, you know? I was uh, taken away from this harsh, what felt like to me, a harsh world where you break things apart into a world that had beauty, that had flow, that had dynamics in it. Um, and I've been, I've been in it since then. Um, by the way, I am using the term complexity science very much uh, in the same way as system science. I do know that the two are considered to be different in many definitions, but I thought for the purposes of today, it, we could safely conflate the two, I think. But I also want to acknowledge that there have been many scientists and thinkers who have seen um, Eastern traditions and recognized how they reflected the interdependent realities of, uh, of the universe and therefore of science itself. So there was Albert Einstein, of course, there was Werner Heisenberg, um, Ilya Prigogine, uh, David Bohm, and currently we've got Fritjof Capra, Carol Sanford, Brian Arthur of, out of a, a list of very many. Um, 
I am excited to be in this field. It is a new field, a growing field, but that's also what makes it so exciting to see in what ways I can actually mold my own life and the science itself to serve all of the different uh, purposes that we need in these very critical times, only made more so with the pandemic, of course. Thanks for that, Sanisha. Yeah, spring. On to you. Uh, it was very fun and uh, inspiring to listen to both of you, Orit and Tanuja, and I can see so many parallels. We're all um, border crosser and uh, bridge builder. Um, so I myself, I was born in China. Uh, I moved to the United States at 22 um, years old uh, to study molecular biology. Um, um, I did my PhD um, in Iowa City, Iowa. So that's a that's a move from China all the way to Iowa City. <laughs> uh, I was facing a lot of complexity. <laughs> uh, yeah, so um, I think I was in my career, I was trained to look at the same, you know, our human body is a complex system. So the first part of my career, I was trained to look at from the Western science uh, perspective, um, like Tanuja talked about in Orit, there's a lot of reductionist and, and analy analytical skills. Um, but at uh, some point in my thirties, um, at the height of my career, something happened in my life that kind of catapulted me to the other side. And I started to, um, I, I started learning Chinese medicine and acupuncture because um, that actually, you know, that is my cultural heritage. And it turned out actually both of my grandpa, uh, maternal and fraternal grandparents, um, they actually worked their whole life in the field of Chinese medicine. I didn't never put those together until I myself became a practitioner. <laughs> um, so then I was like literally flipped the other side around. And, and um, I think the most important, the most uh, striking difference um, when I was a Western scientist, we employ a host of um, machines, instrument measurement to um, capture, to understand you know, this, the, whether it's a cell or some physiological process, we measure, we analyze, um, um, we do experiment. But when I was uh, trained as a West, uh, sorry, um, acupuncturist, a Chinese medicine, I become the instrument. I, 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 I spend a lot, lot of time, a huge amount of time to develop, redevelop my senses, a different way of seeing, smelling, tasting and feeling <laughs> um, to, so, so that's, a, that's, a, a, that's a magnificent shift of versus use, you know, using the instrument versus using ourself as the instrument. Um, you get a different kind of data, different kind of a way of thinking, different kind of way of integrating information. So, um, so I no longer work in the field of medicine because I actually, in the Chinese, um, actually, Chinese medicine was not just applied to treat the physiological body. Chinese medicine actually has a huge a body of philosophical and spiritual work, which um, I felt compelled to translate into the English domain. Uh, that part of the um, uh, uh, Chinese medicine philosophy was, um, was still encapsulated in Chinese language and the ancient classic. Um, so there's a lot of work to be done to bridge these two. Um, you know, when I was a medical practitioner, I realized if I cannot interact with how people, how my patients think, I cannot treat them as a whole person. So, um, and actually in my current field, I'm a coach and uh, I, I work, I help adults to develop their selfhood. I help leaders to a better sense and feel the system and organization they're part of. Um, so I, I, I actually don't consider myself leaving my uh, original, my acupuncturist profession. <laughs> it's just in a different form. Um, and the last thing I want to say that uh, personally, my work is out of a very uh, um, pressing domestic uh, necessity because my husband is uh, uh, American. Uh, <laughs> 
and uh, you know the and he he's he and I work in parallel, and just the the east and west thinking, not just thinking, but way of living and way of being on a day to day uh, level. There's so much to be learned from each other. So we kind of have to create our own language in order to uh, make peace in the household. <laughs> Yeah, no, thank you. It's really fascinating kind of hearing about, you know, all of your stories and connection with this. And one thing that I'm that I'm hearing and, you know, I feel like I can really relate with it is that when, you know, I mean, myself, for example, I'm very much um, immersed in kind of the Western way of thinking. And um, but then as I started looking into kind of Eastern philosophy and Buddhism, I became very interested in that. And and systems thinking or seemingly at a similar kind of time, it, it was really eye-opening. I, I heard this kind of being said that it was it was very subtly different um, in terms of how it perceived the world and it looked at our relationship. And um, and it immediately it started off as kind of like a conflict in my mind that, oh, it, it's, it was, I found it very difficult to put them together and I found a, quite a bit of cognitive distance in my day to day. Um, but actually, uh, you know, obviously I'm, I'm, I'm very, I'd consider myself very early in the journey, but I'm starting to find more of these overlaps and I'm starting to not be so much against, sometimes I'm on the, you know, the Eastern philosophy camp, for example, I'm like, oh, you know, well, a lot of these things that I'm thinking are kind of really futile and sometimes I'm the other way around, but actually I'm like, no, this is really harmonious. And, um, and I think this is, you know, partly why I'm, I'm really intrigued to have this discussion together of, of kind of seeing to what extent these, these gaps really bridge and, and, and the interplay between them. Um, and so just kind of um, moving on a bit, I mean, one thing that um, we said would be great to do is just for each, each of you to put forward a question. Um, and uh, maybe, you know, you could talk a little bit about why this question uh, related to this topic is kind of of interest to you. And we can invite, um, you know, any anyone who wants to discuss this um, and, and, and bring some thoughts on that. And so maybe we could start, Tanuja, with, with you. And you put forward the question of, um, what can we learn from Eastern philosophies and medicine about the relevance and use of context? Yeah. Um, yeah. Tanuja, would you like to just elaborate a bit more on that? And we can invite um, yeah. the perspective of others. Yeah, so I'm going to use um, a, a, a thought experiment or thinking model in order to um, expand on that topic. So um, there is a new way of thinking about the mind, the processes of the mind here in, in Western thought, and it's called the sand pile model of the mind. So the idea is, if, you, if we take a grain of sand and drop it on a surface, and we continue to drop grains of sand, the pile builds up into something like a, a mountain shape, shape of a hill. As we continue to do so, there comes a point in which one grain of sand will cause the collapse of that hill, and then another hill will start to form. So the central issue or the central point here is what caused that collapse? Yeah. So there are obviously two answers to this, or there can be two answers. One is it was that last grain of sand. Yeah. If we choose that answer, we're forced to ask ourselves, but all of the grains of sand that came before it were identical. So what's different about this grain that it caused the collapse? Then we can say, okay, maybe it wasn't the grain of sand. Maybe it was the, the mound itself, the hill. Then we say, well, the hill itself, if you had not put a grain of sand on it, would not have collapsed. So what we see is that the phenomena of collapse is a combination of the shape and structure of the hill and the action of that grain of sand. Yeah. So the hill is the context within which the action happens, which creates an emergent phenomena. So Western thought, and certainly engineers, the way we are educated, we, are, we spend our education, we spend our focus, we spend our eyes, I should say, looking at that grain of sand. We design how we drop it. We it, it, look around you when we talk about uh, a factory manufacturing a computer chip, for example. What are we doing? We are controlling that robotic arm to the, to the micromillimeter 
uh, my, in order to make sure that we get that tiniest of tiniest level of precision, not recognizing that the actual whole, the phenomena that we're wanting, the emergent phenomena that we're wanting is actually a combination of the context on which it is applied and the thing that is applied to it mm -hmm. itself. So to bring context into discussion, I think, is critically important as we go, go forward. It, it, it's, I think, fairly obvious how that applies to, let's say, social or environmental causes. The environment is the environment, it's the, sorry, it's the context in which we human beings are playing. But since we are focusing only on what we do, not if the environment or the context itself can handle our actions or what results from that, that combination, we are missing out on the emergent effect of climate change. You know, even today when we are dealing with climate change, we're trying to reverse it, if you will, or fix it we are still looking for single cause solutions like carbon fixing, you know, and not realizing that climate effects is a combination of context and action. We must look at the context that exists today and how we move forward from there. This, is, this, this uh, point is, is particularly strong when we talk about education. Um, Unfortunately, the way schools are designed today is we ask the student to sit still in a chair and we deliver information. The idea being that the student is supposed to imbibe that information and having imbibed the information, produce a knowledgeable, intelligent child. Not recognizing that the child's context is what needs to imbibe that information. There's an Indian saying, by the way, that learning comes from the combination of the student, the teacher, and the teaching. So the learning is an emergent effect, which is our goal. And it is, comes from a combination of things. We must look at all of them. So the student's natural ability to learn at that point, plus the student's relationship with the teacher, and the relationship with the knowledge that is being delivered to the student produces the learning of the student. Yeah. So um, I think in, in Eastern terms, this would be called yin yang, or in India it would be called Shiva Shakti, where the, the masculine principle is the action and the feminine principle is the structure. Yeah. So, a complex adaptive system can be seen to move from structure to an action, which then changes the structure such that the next action is coming from a new structure. So it's this constant folding, unfolding, folding, unfolding with a constant progression of, of change is how I describe the dynamics of complex adaptive systems. Yeah, thank you. There's, there was a lot there, I mean, about interdependence yeah. and, uh, and, and yeah, obviously context. And I know that interdependence is something that we'll talk about a bit later on as well. But yeah, I'm curious, you know, I mean, you talked about single point solutions there as well and how this kind of is how we tend to look at things. And I know that, you know, the other speakers have a bit of experience on so kind of challenging that a bit. But yeah, I'm curious to, you know, hear people's thoughts on that. Yeah, I I like um, what Chenu just said. Uh, um, stimulate quite a few thoughts in me. Like uh, even this this context, like for example, Chinese medicine is a context based medicine. So the, mm -hmm. for the same symptom, for example, COVID infection, um, in Western science, we will look for the cure and the the, the agent that suppressed the pathogen or the um, vaccine or so on and so forth. But actually for Chinese, uh, train the Chinese medicine herbalist, they will treat the infection in the context of this human being. And, and same, same infection uh, will, the patient with the same infection may get different formula. Um, so it, uh, um, so 
in that sense, I would like to expand a little bit that when we talk about social, um, you know, I'm, climate change is an issue that I'm very much um, in, actively thinking and involved in. And in, in, climate, in the circle of climate change, I always want to um, suggest or propose to people actually um, the context we are uh, interacting with, the environment and natural world is a, not only a context, but also a living context. Mm -hmm. in, in the sense, just like we are living beings interacting with each other, we each have our own independent thought, will, intention, interest, bias. So are our contexts that are around us. So there's a, so a lot of my, um, my um, I'm working on helping people to Kind of re, re but, but the thing is, we in in the Western world and also in modernized country, not just the West, but all over the world, in with the modernization, we have um, kind of de deactivated the part of our nervous system that can talk with our natural environment. I I, I strongly believe that we're all born with that capability and the potential. But if we're not using it, then that part of ourselves become become to, into sleep. Actually, may have nightmares. <laughs> I think some of the problems we're seeing is a nightmare thrown up thrown up by the part of ourselves that we forgot um, mm. or exiled. Um, so mm. re, I totally you know, for me uh, because growing up in China before the industrialization start, uh, thinking in context is just like my natural, mm, that's, that's the water I swam in. Um, but in, actually it's in the, my training in the Western science gave me the ability to articulate what that is <laughs> so that I can communicate to people. And what, what's that like to actually develop or reawaken our capacity to, to have this living relationship, to have this live relationship, intimate relationship with the, the living context around us. I think to me, that's really kind of the key uh, of this very troubles, you know, very troubling work. Uh, I think we, uh, I don't, I, I may venture to say, we all feel like we're that sand, uh, sand dune that uh, Tanuja was describing, <laughs> so waiting for uh, maybe that, that last sand is already being dropped. We can all feel that. <laughs> yeah. Yes, um, maybe I'll, I'll, yeah, curious to hear your thoughts, absolutely. Um, so I think there are, there are a few very important elements there when you talk about context and when you talk about the type of dynamics that uh, both Tanujan and Spring have described. Uh, first of all, uh, traditionally, again, in uh, reductionist uh, Western thinking, we tend to think about clearization. Um, but that last bit of sand is actually a tipping point event, right? Mm -hmm. It wasn't the cause. It's like saying, you know, that the financial crisis was caused by the fall of Lehman Brothers. No, the fall of Lehman Brothers was a tipping point uh, yeah. in the financial crisis that tipped us yeah. into a new system. Um, and that tipping into a new system actually means that the day after the rules of the game, the dynamics have significantly altered. Um, and then the question is therefore, how do you start making sense of that? How do you start to make sense of different players, forces, dimensions? Um, so part of it is to think about context from a holistic perspective. Um, there is no economic system and a political system and a cultural system, right? It's all one system. Yep. We just tend um, to look at it through different windows. And of course, if you think about the evolution yeah. of academics, uh, it was very engineered into different silos, into, into different pieces. But if you really want to make sense of context and reality around us, it's all about understanding the interactions between economics, politics, culture, and technology, yeah. and how together they create a certain yeah. set of circumstances that we need to make sense of. But of course, then there is the different levels of what happens at the individual level, uh, the student, uh, and what happens at the system level of what is actually learning. Um, 
perhaps a, a, I think a, a, a relevant example is thinking about trust and COVID right now. So much of um, policies of, of trying to mitigate or to manage um, COVID is about everyone wearing masks, everyone keeping the distance, right? Everyone washing their hands. Um, there is no point in me just doing that. Mm -hmm. um, I need everyone to do that. So there will be an emergent uh, mm -hmm. property uh, mm -hmm. that will enable collectively to minimize the effect of COVID. And for that, I need to trust that other mm -hmm. people will behave in a similar way. Now that means that trust is a property that only exists at the systemic level of the whole body, of the whole you know, social body rather mm -hmm. than something that exists at my own individual level. Um, once I anticipate or the way I read the context and here is where subjective and experience comes into the game, mm -hmm. only my expectations of what other people will do will affect my own incentive structure for my own behavior mm -hmm. and therefore collectively create or not create um, the kind of circumstances mm -hmm. uh, at the systemic level that we want to see. So really mm -hmm. developing the tools to analyze these uh, synthesize the different dynamics, mm -hmm. and then very importantly, translate that into individual behavior that we want to impact is, is, is where I think these ideas are, are so pivotal. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank, thank you very much. And, um, you know, and, and I think it's, it's really important to, yeah, kind of, and as well, part of, I think what we're doing, we're kind of setting the, the foundations. I mean, for some people that might not be so familiar with them, um, you know, uh, Eastern philosophy or, or even complexity science for that mm -hmm. matter, kind of starting to lay down kind of where some of the ideas diverge a little bit from kind of traditional reductionist mm -hmm. thinking. I think it's really mm -hmm. good to kind of highlight that. And um, one thing I'm aware as well is that a lot of our audience members are, you know, are, are people trying to apply these ideas into kind of organizational context. And yeah. I think it'll be very interesting as well. I mean, uh, later on in the conversation when we kind of get to kind of what this all means kind of in that context yeah. um but but one question um and that you put forward uh, spring um which i think builds really well on some of the topics we were just talking about is if we accept interdependence um what about free will and sovereignty and are they in conflict within uh, with one another and of course in the west this idea of free will and sovereignty is 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 really, you know, a very big point. So I'd be curious to, you know, hear you elaborate on that if you would like to and, and hear the thoughts of yeah. yours. Well, <laughs> I, 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 it's really truly a question I throw out. Uh, I mean, I have some experience within myself, what that is, but what does that look like? I mean, my, um, I think um, the goal is to harmonize these two and, mm -hmm. and the, uh, but we have these Eastern and Western or Democrat, I mean, all kinds of way you can label these. There's these different political social system that prioritize one way more than the other. So we haven't, we don't know what a system look like that truly like swim and uh, um, integrate between these two look like. <laughs> so I think that's kind of on a cutting edge of exploration. Um, I think one thing I would like to contribute is that um, this idea of uh, uh, development. So, you, you know, uh, in our in our education system, in our society, we kind of accept that, um, you know, we start as a baby and we uh, physiologically develop into adulthood. And after that, you know, our education stopped and adult kind of just become uh, set. They, they are done with growing. But we actually, the psychology, you know, psych psychology and uh, um, actually not just psychology, a lot of Eastern spirituality also talks about our, we actually continue to develop not just this, uh, mentally, psychologically, uh, spiritually, but also in a subtle way, physiologically. So we, we continue to develop. So um, come back to this idea of um, interconnectivity and, uh, and free will and sovereignty. I think energetically speaking, if I sense the energy of these two, they represent this, um, they, you know, the free will 
um, sovereignty is kind of more young. It, it has a more of a um, externalizing, expressive, uh, independent feel to it. And the interconnectivity um, has a more of a yin feeling. So the, the, um, I really feel like these two energy are both present uh, in everyone's, in, in human being as a whole person. So if I we actually accept the idea that we're continue, continually developing, then naturally we will see these two strands of development, interconnectivity and, and freedom and independence. They are actually interwining. And at different phase of one person's life, one may take a lead and the other follows. And, and at a, a transition, another take a lead, a diff, uh, a, you know, a different one follows. So if we see a human being as a transitioning of, you know, out of interdependence and independence in and young that way, we might see our human, human society that way too. The development of culture and civilization also will go in and out of this phases of, uh, you know, um, prioritizing independence versus prioritizing interconnectivity. So the question is, can we actually have a social system that actually uh, support the, the flux, the fluctuation between these two energies? It's an interesting question. Yeah, feel free to, to, to chip in as and when you yeah, feel like it. Yeah. Do you, need to, Do you want you to, like go? to go? Yeah, <laughs> sure. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, especially in the United States, the idea of individualism is a very, very strong idea. Um, but when I look at it closely, when, when we talk about the person going out, leaving his family and going out and on his own, structuring his own life, uh, and there's a certain level of disregard for what other people may have expected from him or her or the family may have expected. What I see there is not so much a drive for freedom mm -hmm. as it is a rejection for the structures that, that the person did not like, yeah? Mm -hmm. Because if I really look at freedom itself, like for example, let's say I want to feel free. I as a human being want to feel free, yet I am bound by the needs of my body. I'm bound by the needs of my stomach. I'm bound by the needs of my heart. Every, even the most free individual wants to feel trusted and loved and, and cared for. Yeah. So I think that the, the way freedom has been defined is quite narrow. If we put the word freedom or the need for freedom in a bigger context. It's much closer to what Spring was saying, where it's really about certain aspects sometimes flowing in and out, where we want more freedom in certain things, but we continue to need the other things that bind us. So mm -hmm. it is both a question of proportion, meaning certain individuals need to be bound or feel the need to be bound more than other individuals do, and it is also a question of time. There are certain times that I need more and certain times that I need less. So it's, there, is no, there is no perfect freedom or perfect need for freedom, just as there's no such thing as perfect objectivity or perfect subjectivity. Everything is bound together. Beautiful. If I could add to that, um, I think that Perhaps instead of talking about freedom, we might prefer to talk about degrees of freedom yeah. um, rather than a kind of objective that, that is, is kind of zero one, do I, am I free or am I not free? I think that, uh, and, and I think that that cuts across all societies and all different political social structures. People generally are looking to maximize degrees of freedom within the societies and the networks that they operate. They much more view and judge their lives, not in terms of specifically where they are now, but do they feel that they have the possibility 
um, you know, to improve their lives. It's, it's all about the trajectory of movement rather than specifically where I am today. And I think that understanding that this is the anxiety and this is um, something that drives people helps us understand a lot of uh, social, economic, political phenomena and the challenges that we're dealing with now. Um, but, but part of it is also being aware to what extent we are constrained by the systems and the structures that have emerged unintentionally uh, from what we all do. Because if you think about any good or bad phenomena, whether it's trust, uh, a trust in society that I mentioned earlier, or a conflict, um, those patterns are being recreated every day but by what everyone does. It's not that they're being created and they're fixed, right? We recreate them. And if we recreate them, we need to be aware of actually our responsibility for it. And I think that, you know, the tragedy is when you talk to people in conflict zones, everyone wants peace. And yet their actions and their choices every day recreate the conflict. Similarly, you know, in, in all other uh, problems that we lead when we talk about climate change, when we talk about pollution, when we talk about, you know, um, racism, it's all being recreated every day by the choices that we make. And then the question is, what is the relations between awareness um, and intentional action-driven individuals, which obviously takes us down a whole other philosophical rabbit hole. <laughs> Yeah, um, you know, and just just following up on what you were saying there already, I mean, I, I think it's such an interesting perspective and it, it's similar to what I came across when I came across Nicholas uh, Luchman's work for the first time, the social theorist and systems thinker, where he said the social systems, you know, let's say the idea of money <clears throat> or, you know, many of the institutions or even government in a way that we kind of take it for granted. I mean, you know, we create this government or we create this idea, well, idea, I'm kind of giving it away now of money. And it, it, you know, we kind of assume that it is and it almost exists in its own right. But actually an interesting perspective is that with these types of ideas that have spread and gain a currency, again, I'm kind of dropping all sorts of things here. It's, um, it starts to almost build a life of its own, but it only exists to the extent that we recreate it. Um, and I think, again, when people say the idea of, you know, a baby, I mean, I had my first baby about a month ago, um, and, you know, this whole nature versus nurture idea, and people say, oh, well, baby's just a blank slate. But, you know, to what extent is that valid? Because if you put it into the context again, you know, a baby is grown up in the culture and the language and so many things that yeah. shape how they view the world. And, and relating to what we're saying about freedom, it's if you aren't you know, if you're not building the awareness and acting through, you know, through intention, an awareness of what surrounds you, then it's very easy to just get caught up in the machinery, so to speak. And the question of, you know, how much freedom really exists in that scenario. Um, but, you know, yeah, there's lots of rabbit holes that we can go down, um, but I'd love to to kind of uh, bring it to, to your question, Tunisia, around, um, you know, how does this, um, you know, this idea of of interdependence, you talked about kind of going away from point solutions to, to, to something maybe a bit more systemic um, and, and maybe even freedom if you'd like to. I mean, how all of this connects with um, strategy ultimately and, and creating yeah. impact in, in complex environments as well as what it means for perception of the decision maker. So feel free if you'd like to elaborate on that or it and we can, you know, feel free if anybody wants to add to that. Uh, great. So for me, it's really about, um... At the end of the day, we want to change reality. So using different philosophical frameworks and different theoretical frameworks is all there to help make sense of a reality that we want to change. We all want to change the world, um, you know, in a small way, in a big way, whatever it is. It's all about identifying things that, you know, piss you off in the morning um, and you want to understand how to create an impact. And I think that for me, the tools and, and the concepts taken from complexity theory, and I think that here it, it really mirrors a lot of, 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 of 
some of the key concepts also taken from uh, traditional Chinese thinking and medicine. Um, it's all about how things unfold. It's not about what will happen. It's about how things happen. And once you get an understanding of some of those basic rules of how things happen, then you know how to anticipate them and you can think differently about how to create impact. And I think that generally, when we look at systems, when we look at these emergent properties, when we look and understand that so many of these dynamics are really what together interdependently create the problems that we're seeing, at the end of the day, it's about two things. It's about either identifying patterns that we want to disrupt or identifying patterns and dynamics that we want to enhance. And by identifying the points of interventions, and there'll always be multiple points and not you know, a single uh, silver bullet solution, then you can gradually manipulate, subvert, change, however you want to look at it, those different dynamics, enhance some, disrupt others, and gradually cause a transformation of that system, hitting certain tipping points, because you know that this is how systems change, you will hit a tipping point, and preparing for that. And I think that once you start to look at it from that view and look at it from an interdependent perspective, it actually opens up so many strategic possibilities. Because if everything is connected to everything else, for example, you can impact the system from anywhere. You don't have to be the top dog. Uh, you can be a side player and actually create an amazing impact. Um, you can actually create a lot more impact, you know, upstream than downstream when everything is, is so convoluted and already with so many vested interests. Uh, so this type of way to start to make sense of a problem as a, a, a complex system, which is driven by so many context and yet apply an understanding of the kind of laws of nature of, of those complex propensities of how things unfold allow you to devise just much better strategies to create real impact i think that's the gist of it yeah yeah do you want to go spring i i um what ara described is uh very illuminating and you know, the, there's a lot of things like uh, in Chinese, in my training and practice, we, I do it intuitively. I don't necessarily know what, how it is done. And uh, um, hearing art is almost like giving me a point where I can stand outside and looking at what, what I, what, what my intuitive and consciously know. And my question, um, and as I was listening to art, I was constantly thinking, how can, how can someone who's motivated to change the system to find that intervention point out of a myriad of selections? You know, it's, it's, as we're facing complex system, the possibilities overwhelms our um, an analytical strategy. Uh, we can't analyze our way to find, and we only have limited resource. Uh, we all have own limited resource. So how do I, knowing that I have this much amount of resource how do i find the, the uh what's the phrase get the ban out of the how to say that get the most ban out of the box is that how you say yeah. it? <laughs> bang, bang for your buck yeah, yeah. <laughs> how do you get the most ban out of your box um that process is what i'm really interested in because i find that selection if you, if i look at those individuals who uh, succeed in making that selection they they're they're coming from a different place they're coming from um the the select the the choice come from a different place it comes from um i'd say more instinctual almost we have to activate some of our instinctual knowing uh which is actually um you know i i think um this actually goes back to how do we look at the, the more um, prim primal part of ourselves. I think activating, it's, it's, it's a, we're living in a um, time that's so pressing and so, um, cri so, so full of crisis. That it is more and more, either we do it consciously or the situation will 
force us to, to more and more get in touch with the instinct primal uh, primordial aspect of yourself because that part of self has to come online in order for us to um, to sniff out to smell <laughs> to you know because that's what we've been doing for millions of years before the modern civilization started as and you know we we all have that ancestral kind of imprint of being a, a uh, facing the complexity of nature just by our sheer body, sheer um, presence as, as one hu hu naked human being facing this complexity. And we have such a, evolution has put in this, uh, has put in a lot of wisdom in shaping our instinct, instinct and primal part of ourselves. Mm -hmm. So how do we, and we have this magnificent brain with from access to all these oceans of information so how do we create a pathway that we can integrate these different sides of ourselves? Yeah. I mean, in a way, that's what we're doing under ancient meets modern. <laughs> that we've, we've seen all three of us, all four of us, <laughs> life. Yeah. 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 To me, or its point about um, looking at the dynamics of it and looking at the unfolding brought to mind uh, in Chinese and Indian medicine, the idea of flow, yeah, that things must flow, the, whether you call it energy or whatever it is, that disease is a blockage of the flow. And further, um, in Indian philosophy, certainly we talk, the language says that there is no such thing as an object. Everything is a process. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So um, the idea of flow is, is a in my opinion, a, a very positive and very um, uh, dynamic way of thinking about change. So change might seem like you have to destroy something in order to create something new. But if you think of it as flow, then everything is changing all of the time. So what changes, you know, to your question, Bowen, about strategy, about organizational structures and so on, what changes here is metrics. You see, so if we recognize that flow is the essence of life, if you will, and um, and that all effects are emergent effects because they're they they're formed from the combination and the interaction of things, then our eyes must be looking at the emergent effect in order to operate with the tools that we have in our hands, you know. Um, so similarly, so the metrics now become at a different level. Yeah. So the metrics are at the level of effect while the operations, the operational metrics are at the, at the level of the tools that we have in our hands. This is, this is, I think, a conceptually a very critical difference that we should look at. Um, so for example, a child going to school, we want to measure the child's learning. How we measure it is, is a separate issue, but we want to measure the child's learning, not the fact that I have delivered certain lessons to the child. Yeah, so that's, and I think in acupuncture, this is done very well, where um, an intervention is, is, uh, is uh, given to the patient, but the intervention is only just enough then there's a period of waiting. Then there's a new intervention. So that period of waiting is a way to look at the emergent results. So it is a, that, that entire methodology is based on the idea of context, emergent effects, and interventions at the point that we are. So from a strategy perspective, this is, I think it completely changes the way we look at strategy. It also initiates or brings into the equation something that is um, very different than the way things are done today. And it's the idea that the doer, the manager, the CEO, whoever, is part of the whole. He or she is not standing outside manipulating the organization. The organization is not sitting in a Petri dish that the person stands there in a lab coat and manipulates it and then takes all the rewards from it. So the manager, the, the life of the manager, the life of the CEO is the life of the company itself. So we can no longer separate the two. And I think this is a critical change that needs to happen in, in uh, 
management and corporations. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's fascinating. And, and, you know, as I, as I reflect on just what you were saying there, Tunisia, um, you know, I have a background in, in management and, and, you know, you talk about metrics and it's, it's quite a loaded term because you think metrics and a lot of us have been kind of, well, I can speak for myself, I've been su subject to metrics in different ways and it kind of creates mm -hmm. incentive systems. And often there could be a bit of a, a negative emotional mm -hmm. feeling towards metrics, but actually, you know, what you were saying there and what Aaron, Aaron Spring was saying got me to think more about metrics as, you know, the world is very complex. It's a bit too much for our minds to, to, to see objectively. And so we need a lens to kind of abstract what is really happening. And from, I guess, on an, on an organizational level, one institutionalized way is of metrics. And if we believe in, I think there's a quote, was it by Max Clamp, uh, Planck, sorry, uh, who said, when you change the way you see things, the, thing, yeah. the things you see change. Right. If, if we believe in that, um, idea then actually when you change what you are looking at the lens of yeah. the metrics say yeah. you start to get a different emergent thing yeah mm -hmm. yeah yeah so Bowen you were you were objecting to the idea of metrics and how it may have uh, oppressed you or us uh, a little bit but I'd like to say that we have to measure regardless at every point every stage of our life we have to measure yeah. So metrics are necessary. But if we see metrics as a stepping stone, as an assistant towards a goal, then the metrics become a tool. And but we must be willing to change the metrics as we go. See, so first we have to include the agent, the doer, as part of the system. Then we must look at metrics as a change agent, the metric itself as a change agent. And then we must be willing to change the metric itself as the context changes. Mm -hmm. See, so the whole thing needs to become a lot more dynamic than it is. Yeah, thank you. I'm just just aware of time. I mean, for me, it's, it's, it's really, really flown by. And um, we'd love to kind of um, read out some of the some of the questions from the audience shortly, but maybe just as kind of a, a, a last thing, if if we could turn to each of you and and because obviously the topic um, today is you know looking at what we can learn from um, from Eastern philosophy and, and how that integrates with uh, complexity into into our kind of our, our you know in our day to day lives and, and organizational context, kind of what do each of you see as like a promising, I don't know how best to frame this, but a promising thread or some examples that you're seeing that you think, or, or maybe some some ideas that you've come across that you think are, can be really powerful and relevant for us today. Um, what what might come to mind there? Um, and so, uh, yeah, maybe spring, could, we could start with you and move on to uh, Orit and Tunisia. Um, this idea comes to my mind as, as we're talking about complexity, uh the the way to interact it was is not simply coming up the next clever analysis or strategy or approach but actually returning to our simplicity returning to our inner simplicity um there um because because there um you know if, if we look at the biological world um Many biological entities, like an ant hill or a beehive, they individual on an individual level uh, compared to our human uh, capacity, they might be very simple, but they actually collectively uh, form into an emerging complex system. And maybe that's what's happening at the human level too. Uh, we actually, the lens through which we look at the system also complexified <laughs> the, the, the world we're living in. So actually coming, returning to our simplicity, I think is a very important thread um, that I, I'm seeing more and more, uh, many more people are actually not only feel called to, but also living by that principle. And so that they create more of a stabilizing micro environment in the kind of very stormy world where we're, um, we're seeing today, yeah. Thanks for that, Spring. Okay, and Orit? Um, 
just to continue um, in this line, I think that there is a very important element of humility um, and a very important actual freedom that you get once you understand how complex and dynamic and ever-changing the system is and that it is all about flows. And therefore, anything you end up doing is an experimentation and it's fine. It's an experimentation. You're going to see what happened and then you're going to decide what you do next. And I think that once you take that lens, um, I'm also, um, I have a small tech startup and I'm developing this product and actually thinking about the product itself rather than through an engineering lens, but as this living, breathing, evolving element that I continue to intervene in, seeing what's happening, seeing what the reaction within the ecology is, actually leads you down a much more creative path while also understanding that actually you know very little and it's all about monitoring and learning through the journey. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Yeah, go ahead, Tanisha. Yeah, so I'd like to leave with a couple of points which I think are critical now that we have the knowledge that we do and the platform of complexity science that allows us uh, to go through the world in a different way. The first one I'd like to leave with is the idea of structure and process, which I've talked about before, and how we can, how we can embody that in uh, in our organizations, yeah? In the organizational structure itself, in its strategy, in the way we do project management and so on. Um, secondly, the idea of connections and roles. So rather think of relationships or connections between two entities that are entities frozen, if you will, that don't change. We know everything is changing. So let's think in terms of people, entities, organizations, playing roles for the time that they play them, yeah? And the system then is made up of role players and the connections between them, yeah? So harmony within the system or simplicity as Spring calls it is, um, is then the quality of the connections. Are the connections between the, these entities, are they, uh, are they in a way that, the, that is natural for those roles, yeah? And one last point we, we didn't get to touch today, but complexity science has shown us that every act of decision making of a complex adaptive system is an act of cognition. And cog because the, the, the system is making a choice on which stimuli to respond to or not. So making cognition a central player now completely changes the way we look at dynamics, the way we look at and operate with a complex adaptive system. And I'm very excited about that. It, it elevates everything to a, uh, one may say it creates humanity in everything. Yeah, thanks for that. And, and I think a great, a great note to, to kind of wrap up on them. Um, yeah, thank you. And and so we, we have a few questions from the audience. Um, I think we were kind of starting to, to, to get more to this towards this at the end as well. And we're um, talking about kind of how, you know, we talked about kind of the, the personal and the, the ethical, um, and, but also how that extends kind of to our wider environment and the systems that we are part of in a way. And, yeah. um, and the question is, how how do um, sustainable and viable socio-economic socio -economic and technological systems, how do they evolve, how can they evolve according to some of these ideas of, of Eastern philosophy? I know it's something we touched upon a little bit and anyone who would like to add to that, you know, feel free. Um, again, you know, all social economic systems are emerging, transforming in flows. So I think it's already there. Um, the question is, which way would you like to change it? And of course, different players have different visions about where they would like to push those uh, trajectories towards. Uh, and then understanding who you are in that system and therefore, what does reality and the context look like through your own window onto that and therefore how you can create impact? Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Yeah. 
To me, the word sustainability immediately brings to mind the idea of responding to change. Because sustainability means you need to you need to survive, yeah? The only way you can survive in a system that is changing all the time is to know how to respond to change, which essentially means to change yourself. So creating, uh, when we design um, structures or technologies, how are they able to change themselves as the context changes? So design today is really the end goal of design is a product today. It isn't really about uh, building in changeability to the product and that needs to change. I really um, relate with um, both of what he said. I think it's already happening. The, you know, this, um, the Eastern philosophy is already being in enact, implemented on a large scale. Um, it, as an individual, um, I think connecting to what the, the, in our checkout, this, this uh, humility, this sense of not knowing is really important. We can, when we're facing complexity, we have to accept we cannot know, we cannot predict the impact of our action. We, the only thing we can do is be authentic as possible, as committed as possible in our own individual responsibility and fulfillment um, and responsibility to the system and then experiment and then see what happens um, uh, with this open openness to whatever results that come. Um, yeah, so not knowing, <laughs> open to whatever comes. Yeah, thank you. And I think one common thread for me, and it relates to what you were saying earlier, or about, you know, kind of almost embodying this, 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 some of these ideas from Eastern philosophy and kind of the systemic view is, you know, realizing that everything's in flow and everything's connected and that mm -hmm. you can't know. And so you just put something out there and you really stay open to it, as you were saying, spring, and you see what comes back. And actually there's something quite liberating about that, that yes. you don't have to, you know, have a grand plan for everything that you, that part of sensing and seeing is part of the fun of it. Um, thank you for that. Um, and so this is a question for uh, Tanuja and actually it, it yeah, it, it relates to, to the question earlier. So um, I'm not sure, maybe we can, yeah, maybe, like, yeah, let, let's ask it. So how can I learn and apply Eastern ideas on complexity to economic and technological systems? And um, also how to facilitate systems thinking among students and policymakers? It's a big question, huh? <laughs> um, <laughs> so first of all, children are natural complexity thinkers. It's unfortunately educated out of them. So let's not touch the children. I think let's leave them as they are. Let's touch the education system, yeah? Um, and there is a perfect, perfect scenario for, um, for implementing what Spring and Orit has talked about is the humility because teachers and the teaching uh, practice is how, how can we have the arrogance to say, that we can control the mind of a student. There is no such thing. To approach it with humility is really the only position we can take in there. And I think that we need to bring back, what's happening is actually the reverse in education. More and more management techniques from the industrial age are coming in. And that's kind of frightening. Uh, it's happening in New York City where people are trying to increase the, uh, the performance, especially in the STEM fields. Um, and the response to that is to bring in more technology and more control rather than understanding that learning is an emergent effect. Yeah. Let's bring in the agent, the teacher into the solution, into the practice, and let's all keep our eyes on the emergent effect. Now for the, the question about economic systems. So this is a, um, a classic case where we have made a mistake of looking at the economy as a set of actions. The economy is a context within which all of us operate. And in the equivalent in technology terms would be it's a platform. Like Facebook is a platform, Amazon is a platform in which other people operate. So the role of a platform is to provide the facilities in which the, the other agents can operate. And so, 
economic systems, if you will, or, or the folks who keep, who are the guardians of the economy. Um, and I would say that would be the government for one. Um, their role needs to be to look at the structures, to look at the systemic effects that come out of agents collaborating within that context. Yeah. Thank you for that, Tanisha. And it, it kind of, you know, almost when you say the context, it's almost I'm thinking like a soil, you know, the economy yeah, in a way exactly. is like a soil from which things can emerge. And yeah, that is quite different to, to you know, oh, it's, yeah, it's kind of like a machine. A lot of people describe economy like a machine yeah. and it's just certain triggers and more of a linear approach. Thank you. Um, and so the that, last, sorry, yeah. So just to add to that, I think that a further way you can look at it, and especially when you look at the economy, is thinking about it as an ecology. And when yeah. you think about an ecology, it's really about what are the conditions that allow an ecology to thrive and be resilient. And once you take that step, what it means to actually intervene and, and help sustain that ecology becomes much more visible. And therefore, when you think about technology and when you, when you assess different technologies and when you think about products, if you think about them as organisms within an ecology that are themselves constantly evolving, then again, you have a completely different way to develop products, to develop services and how to maintain right. the economy as a whole, as opposed to, you know, old 20th century um, yeah. ideas that are no longer relevant. Yeah, yeah. And the word ecology is such an important word in the context of complex systems, because ecology means the harmonious interplay of diverse players. Yeah, that's what an ecology is. So the definition itself says it all. Yeah, love it. Thank you. Um, and, and if you're able to, to stick around for the, for the last question, I know that we're yeah, we're reaching kind of an hour and 15 minutes. Um, this one, I, I wonder if it's a question um, that you, you might um, have a relation to or it as, as someone who is kind of in the academic field as well yourself. Um, the question is how does systems thinking differ from network thinking um, on a research mm -hmm. level? Yeah. It, it's not. Um, <laughs> it's yeah, I'm not, I, I did, <laughs> yeah, sure, go ahead. <laughs> uh, ah, sorry, there was more to that question, sorry. No, 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 that was it. Because I, I wasn't sure if it, if it relates to, to, you know, what you've looked at in the past, but I just thought I'd put it forward. All systems are network based. Uh, our bodies are network based. Everything that has evolved in the universe is network based. Cities are networks. Uh, so really you can't understand a system without understanding the networks and actually it is the behavior between individual nodes within the network that then create the systemic structures that then go back and feed into creating different incentives and constraints on what people can actually do at the local level. Uh, so you have to understand networks and you have to understand network behavior, network theory to understand systems. I'm, I'm wondering, would you say already that the system is a multi-dimensional network? So it's network mm -hmm. is not on like a flat level, but also vertical level and even probably many more dimensions. Yeah. Yes, with multiple flows uh, yeah. within it, information, resources, behaviors, and you know, it is definitely yeah. um, in that sense, uh, multidimensional. Yeah, and, and speaking of multidimensional, I think the uh, discussion we've had today is uh, is definitely a very multidimensional <laughs> conversation. And you know, I, I I have to say it's been it's been really enriching for me, and it's been a real real pleasure kind of taking part in this. And 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 you know, it, it's been an honor having you all here. So um, unfortunately, we're out of time now. But I wanted to thank you all for joining us today, and and everyone who joined us from living rooms across the world. Um, and uh, were there any kind of last thoughts or, or last uh, comment you wanted to say uh, while we're here? No, this was amazing. Thank you so much. And, and I've learned so much. And, and I thought, you know, I really enjoyed and learned through the conversation. So thank you for putting it all together. Yeah, thank you very much. Yeah, I was very pleased to see, hear all the questions because it means that there are folks who are thinking along these lines already. Yeah, and I would uh, welcome us to play with complexity. Yeah. Because yes. that's where as we are children, we are not we naturally do that. And now we have even more resource and tools to play. 
Yeah, the message is now go use all of this and do yeah. something with it. <laughs> that's right. Yeah, that's right. No pressure. <laughs> Make mistakes. <laughs> yeah, okay. and great. Yeah. And, that, and that's the part. And there's nothing. Yeah, wrong that's the way I feel allow us to help to make mistakes. That's right. Love it. Go out and make yeah. mistakes. That's the takeaway. Well, that's that's <laughs> very empowering to me anyway. Well, thank but you take so much responsibility again. for those mistakes, right? True. Right. We're adults <laughs> now. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, thank you so, so much. And um, yeah, it's been wonderful. Thank you. Thank all. you and, so uh, much, everyone. Thank you all. Yeah. Bye. Have a great day. Bye bye. bye, -bye.